Hi, Doug. Bonnie, how are you, my friend? I'm glad you could make it. I am excited to be here. I've got lots to learn. Excellent. We have about three minutes, my friend. Take your time. Doug, how's your family doing? Everyone staying safe? Absolutely. Uh, we're doing well. You know, my uh, wife is a medical director, so uh, my understanding is they're rolling out uh, the vaccine first recipients uh, uh, now. So it's a kind of a historic moment uh, for all of us um, because this is part of uh, the turnaround, right? The turn of the tide. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, looking forward to 2021. Have you guys done any new Christmas traditions or holiday traditions for, you know, the weird year that we're in? No, I mean, uh, I am known for cooking. Actually, my family has Southern roots. So I ship in like a Virginia smoked Edwards country ham. Uh, I also deep fry turkeys. I, I think I smoked a turkey for Thanksgiving. So that's kind of our tr tradition. Like I usually, you know, it's like an all day cooking thing that starts at 4 a.m. What time is dinner? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be there, Doug. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Open invitation, don't worry. You know, uh, that, that's why this, this vaccine thing, that's what that's really about, you know, so we can start having fun again, right? That's what we that's all want. Okay, so Lisa, this it's eleven o'clock. Do you? I think uh, we have a packed agenda. I'm thinking that we get started here. Yeah, I think go ahead. We've got a um, big group still that's probably going to be jumping in throughout the program. But I think sure. if you want to go ahead and get get it kicked off, that's great. Okay, fantastic. So um, again, welcome to all San Diego Chamber of Commerce members and leaders of the small business community. Many thanks to the ongoing trust, confidence, and support of Lisa Kelly and Karen Stewart. At this very challenging time for small businesses, I encourage all chamber members and to ask your friends, families, partners, clients, customers, even other business owners, join the Chamber of Commerce. The success of all small business is all of our collective responsibility. Um, today, my friends, you are definitely in the right place. We're going to talk about how you're going to take control of your social media small business narrative. This session will be one hour in duration with 50 minutes of lecture, including interactive polling questions. So I'm going to keep you on your toes. Don't worry about that. Um, we'll have 10 minutes for questions at the end. In the interim, please mute and record your questions. You can put them in the chat. Um, or you know, keep them and then at the end, I'll hang around a little longer and then I can answer any of your own personal business questions. So uh, first of all, why is it important to take control of your business narrative? Well, your business is your story. This goes back to the last session we were talking about. Tell your story well, or someone else will tell it better or even worse, steal it, especially on social media. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, really a variety of areas to strengthen your core business com competitiveness with social media. But first of all, who's this guy? So I go by Doug, just Doug, nothing as formal as Douglas Younger III as I can thank my late parents for that one. But I'm a husband, father with 20 years of marketing experience having traveled over 1 million miles in over 40 countries. Like anyone on social media, I have a personal life I enjoy many hobbies or 
interests is another key term in social media. As my 16 years as an alto sax player, I was a child tennis prodigy starting at three and started men's division at 12 and even played a little D1. Definitely wasting more hours than I should ever admit playing Bungie's Destiny. And I definitely have been accused of being an entertainment snob with my literature and book choices, which you can see some of my all time top science fiction novels behind me on my wall. That's my personal life, right? Um, and, you know, more related to the topic on hand, I am both personal and professional content creator and active user of social media, primarily LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. But obviously, because of my professional uh, affiliations, I have Yeah, audio went out, Doug. Hey, Doug, I think the audio is, is out, unfortunately. How about now? Can everyone hear me okay now? Not unclear. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you're back. Perfect, perfect. So, so. I was actually opening up to all of you. So this is actually my first business venture. Um, I actually bootstrapped th uh, three steps forward myself with 12 months in operation, 20 clients. We have over 30 employees. And this is our third chamber webinar. Um, we've received uh, accreditation or certification in the state of California. And we're also pursuing minority business uh, certification. But most importantly, like yourself, and I share this with you, is because we're surviving the pandemic as a small business owner one day at a time. And, you know, there's no difference between the two of us other than maybe how we embrace you know, certain st strategies. Now, um, I also agree with Peter Drucker's ideals of keeping abreast of change with lifelong learning. A lot of you don't know why I'm so interested in actually coming on the chamber and talking in front of you is that actually I'm embracing the concept of lifelong learning. And I will actually be also an MBA instructor um, for the executive program at Cal State University East Bay teaching social media. So hence, you know, um, this is not my first uh, gig talking about this. So you can see, I believe there's no substitute for real world experience as a small business owner, but the application of empirical new ideas for novels, literature, and other things, um, I'm saying, why not have the best of both worlds? So to kick off our session on social media, I'd like to start with a little uh, group participation. So I would encourage anyone to write in the chat and share to other small business owners one book recommendation that you have uh, that you know you could help someone in the pandemic. Every little bit helps. My recommendation, I'm going to type in the chat here, is Mastering the Rockefeller Habits of what you must do to increase the value of your growing firm. Boom, there we go. So you're gonna, I want everybody to get used to this because we're gonna be a little interactive here. So uh, please fill in your book whenever you have a chance. And then uh, you know later on, that will be a gold nugget for other business owners. So. Learning objectives of today. Let's talk about that. We're gonna talk about how you as a small business owner can use social media for personal brand amplification for yourself, but more importantly, how your business should allocate resources for specific social media activity that can enhance growth. We'll be looking at methods of achieving reach defined as the total number of people that read, consume, or listen on social media platforms of choice that you can choose for delivering content. Also, we're gonna look into pros and cons of organic versus paid content. 
methods of monitoring your progress quantitatively. And lastly, some enabling technologies for deployment. Okay, first lesson of the day is what exactly is social media? Do we have agreement on this? Oxford Languages defines social media as websites and applications that enable users to create and share content or to participate in social network networking. But do we all agree? Let's find out. Our first interactive poll question of the day is what exactly is social media? A, networks, B, users, C, technology, D, content. E, none of the above and maybe that you don't care or F, all of the above. And there we go, I just launched the poll. So please, you should see a pop-up on your screen. Feel free to cast your vote. Look, we got one for all of the above. Don't worry, you can't go wrong. Just go ahead, cast your vote. There's, there's nothing wrong. This is just a poll, simple poll. Okay, we've got a little variance. We've got some, oh, there we go. All right, now we got some participation. We're loosening up here. Very good. Okay, very good. All right, so first, okay, let's talk a little bit about why social media and why it's so complex. You see, to master social media, even if we don't agree, as small business owners, we have to get our limited personal perspective, get beyond our limited personal perspective. It's about reaching and communicating with potential customers, period. No matter how young, no matter how old. We all average out as capitalists that green is green. We need to reach specific target audiences with our unique, wonderful small business offerings with whatever channel or technology or content that's necessary. So now I get it though, social media is complicated. So we may not all agree on what social media is exactly, but we can describe that there are a lot of concepts involved with using social media as an enabler for small business, okay? In a small business universe of infinite possibilities, we have to prioritize leveraging our strengths and lack of resources. Digital marketing is a cost-effective approach that all of you should be making reasonable investments in right now. But social media can be overwhelming, intimidating. For me, it's kind of like migrating from analog bookkeeping to QuickBooks. If you've done it, you know what I'm talking about. Let's simplify this social media jargon into a few key concepts. Okay, let's talk about the economic transaction that what is really happening with social media. You see, let's start first, channels. Channels are portals to small business audiences. Channels are powered by technology providers like Facebook or Twitter. As a business owner, you have complete control over how your business is represented on a given platform. Think of your social channel like the virtual storefront of your business. So you need to think about how it appears to first time visitors, such as to look at your profile banner or what's your description text like? What type of content do you deploy or you don't deploy? Using an analogy, will anyone take you seriously if you don't frequently stock your real world storefront with new wares? The same applies with social media. Most importantly, Consider how potential customers can find your channel. So careful attention to naming of your handle, consistent promotion of your handle on your website, maybe on your email signatures, right? References to your handle should be encouraged by yourself, employees, and influencers. Next comes audiences. Audiences are potential customers or opportunities for small businesses, and you need to start thinking of them that way, that audiences aren't just they're not a marketing or sales qualified lead yet, but they potentially could be. And even more, you see, audiences could be advocates to tell other people about your service in a review or even refer people. Now, let me be clear. Audiences you don't have control over, no control, okay? But you can monitor what they do and reward good behavior. Like in YouTube, some of you have seen those special discount promo codes you can penalize bad behavior in audiences as well. So you can block their accounts for bothering your great customers. You have to recognize the most important currency for audiences is their time. On social media, don't waste it. Now let's talk about content. 
Content is virtual currency for your small business. Audiences want to consume content using their primary currency, which is time. You see, as small business owners, you have full control of your content, meaning indirectly you're exchanging content for audiences, okay, for the audience time. And you want to provide them interesting approaches to tell them about your services, your product, your location. The exchange of content for time is the most important business transaction on social media. Building your content for social media is an investment your ticket to play the great game. You can win the game, but not without a ticket. Activity, which you don't have control over, is the net aggregate result of content being consumed for time. Small business owners have no control of social media activity. No guarantees here, guys. But you can monitor so that you can make adjustments on things you can control, which is your channel or your content. Okay. Well, you say, Doug. This is like an econ class. Well, let me summarize. Social media can be simplified into an equation. Your unique service as content, provided as content, communicated on a channel, okay? In a provocative manner, because you want content for time transitioning and that you wanna drive activity. In some indirect ways, even manipulate activity that will favor your small business. This my friends is the economic value of social media for small business. Now, let me take a shot at what you're thinking here. You say, Doug, I agree that social media is worth small business. And duh, Doug, everybody knows that. But I don't have many followers or I don't even know if any of the customers wanna to talk to me or I just hate social media, Doug. Remember, no excuses. Saying these things is kind of like my son cautiously stepping into a dark room saying, is anybody there there? Which is toddler speech. Well at least from my, my son's perspective, it's time to turn the light on, depending on your industry, okay? So let's talk a little bit about, you know, social media is kind of like dark matter. It's scientifically proven to be large, as you can see here on this, this table here. 3.9 billion human lives are on social media. And that represents half of all people um, and, and that are now engaging on the platform and growing at 10% per year. That's huge. And also the majority of that group, they're doing it on their phone. So that's another revelation that you have to think about, okay? So, you know, next I would say that the pandemic, if anything is accelerating that. Facebook alone represents 2 billion human lives exchanging content for time annually. That's 2 billion of four total. You can't ignore Facebook, even if your industry channel of need is, say, DoorDash. The battle for audience, tonality, or that means the positive or negative sentiment or opinion is won on Facebook, largely of all topics. You see, overall, Facebook is facing more scrutiny because of its size and density. And then, you know, let's prove it. You say, Doug, prove it. I like Instagram. Okay. So, first of all, another note to talk about is demographics. And I get it, you're gonna say, social media is really for those Gen Z, Gen I, and millennials, right? Like, you know, well, guilty as charged, right? But definitely, you should think of it this way. In a variety of purchase activities, such as discovering brands via ads, recommendations, there are increasing percentages of Gen X and baby boomers. What you can see here in this category is that, look, researching products online via social media, Almost half of the millennials and Gen Xs are doing that. But if you note, even when you get out into baby boomers in Gen X, they're at 33 and 25%. So they're participating, they're participating. It's everybody's getting in the game. So therefore you as a small business owner need to get in the game. Well, you say, oh, Doug, you know, but my industry, it's not that significant or it doesn't matter. Okay. Well. Here's some data from Rival IQ that has discovered that brands are most consistently active on Facebook. And by the way, I'm not saying Facebook because I personally love the platform. Like I, I don't, I'm not saying that I have to disclose that I'm getting payments from them or I'm an influencer for Facebook. I'm not saying that. I'm saying raw data would say that you need to not ignore it. 
you see engagement rates, which is on the y axis over here, which is an aggregate of people liking, sharing, and participating. Um, actually, uh, and on the x axis here, you have posts per day. So, what you can see is people that are in media, yeah, they're posting very actively. And sports teams, yeah, they want you to follow them. But what you can note here on the left here is a big cluster of the industries that a lot of you are participating in right now higher education, hotels, nonprofits, financial services. And they're posting at about 1.5 posts per day. So that means you need to get more active. You know, I get that question a lot. Like, how much am I supposed to post? Well, stick to your industry is my answer. Next, I would say to take a look at, okay, this chart is saying COVID-19, if anything, is accelerating the use of, of social media. What you can see is 54% of users 16 to 64 are actually watching more shows on streaming. 43% are spending longer in sessions on social media and 42% are spending longer on messenger services. And the trend goes on and on. So I get it. Social media is annoying, frustrating, definitely time consuming. Is it worth your time to invest in social medias for your business? Well, I would argue that the audience sizes and your reach or lack thereof is worth fighting for. Don't succumb to the beliefs of your rivals, that competitors of different opinion, that they want to eat your lunch, or the analogous do nothing, or that disgruntled customer, or the attitude that nothing ever changes. Because at the end of the day, they'll all step up and they'll do it on social media. Next, this let's talk about you know, again, my obsession with mentioning Facebook. You see, honestly, the demographics and audience participation should dominate the greater whole of your mental energy. So I get the question a lot. What channel should I choose? Again, you know, I would argue, okay, that in my personal opinion, choosing a social media channel is more like choosing a Mac versus a PC. Preferences dominate. But if you want some objectivity, take a look at this data from TrackMaven. In 2016, there was a study that aggregated social media use by industry. You, what you can see is apparel, automakers, restaurants, consumer products, uh, cable, food, beverage, and so forth. What you'll note here is that in this graph, Facebook is ubiquitous across industries um, by consumers. And also that's something of note, and this is important for small business owners, it's actually not that, although Facebook is ubiquitous, most industries have multiple social media channels they participate in. In fact, what you can see is they're dominated by two. One that dictates heavy influencer activity like Instagram or Twitter or whatever is their industry centric channel. But the others are gonna use Facebook just for the audience size. So the key takeaway here is you're gonna probably need multiple social platforms and that most likely Facebook is gonna be in there. Next point is about content creation being voluntary and involuntary, right? Some additional considerations in the modern era is that if you're gonna participate on social media, one requirement, you may not have a choice. You may have to play the game and good luck trying to control it because its industry is dominated by those that issue complaints, right? Tell me what you really think, right? Either a complaint by definition can be good or, or a user review can be good or bad. Such reviews require oversight via monitoring. I mean, it's fine that they have their opinion on Yelp and that you know they don't like your establishment or your brand or your secret sauce. You could try to block them or hide it, but it would be better if your best customers defend you publicly, okay? So small business owners must embrace the primary attribute of content. Content creation is voluntary. And if you decide you can create written text posts, pictures, menus, uh, you can put videos of your chefs preparing food. If you master this concept, responding to negativity doesn't have to be so direct like a blog. Instead, you could release content or counter content, proving the meticulous work or the quality of your establishment or the love of your customers. And again, the slippery slope of the content is that yeah, it can be involuntary. The negative user can do it, but you can also respond with positivity. And that's kind of the power of social media. And also you can't take things personally. What you can see on this graph here on the right is that millennials and Gen Xers 
more than 50% of the time are going to issue a complaint on social media. Okay. And in many cases, and it's 10 to 20% in each of these industries. So, you know, it's assumed that you're going to see certain type of activity and you have to manage it. Okay. So next, it's time for a little interactive polling. I get there is a lot of empirical information on that. Let's actually talk about a hypothetical scenario. Okay. Many of you learned earlier when I started this session that I love to cook, right? So let's think about a hypothetical future post COVID where Doug's second business venture and passion project is a food truck called the Righteous Indignation, provider of the world's best soul food mac and cheese, right? That's what I'm really good at, if you want to know. And it receives an amazing review with a photo and a testimonial from its best customer which typically tends to be for insiders to know my wife, okay? So here's the question. Can I, as a small business owner with a food truck, legally share as a regram on Instagram a positive user review of my best customer, right? All right, so now let's, I'm gonna pop up this poll and we're gonna see what everybody thinks here. Now, remember, this question is, can the owner legally share this regram on Instagram? Oh, look at this. Yeah, there's some debate amongst you out there. I love it. I love it. Okay. If you choose yes, it's quite understandable. Okay. You could say, just do it, Doug. The tools are there. Common use, people regram things all the time. The tools exist, so just do it. But... If you answer no, you can't legally regram without approval. You paid attention to that business insight on the left, on the bottom there. You see, a great blog article, the number two top of the six social media mistakes small business owners make is not getting regram approval, okay? The appropriate action would be to thank my wife on her Instagram post thread and ask for permission to regram on my thread and then post her original content with some thanks to her. Well, you're gonna say, Doug, that's super complicated. Well, the reason why is related to privacy in digital rights management. I had to go there. It's heavy stuff. I had to do it. So let's talk about privacy, okay? Actually, there was a case of state in Gruel in Connecticut and this essentially is related to the involuntary posting of a diary on social media, particularly Facebook, shows its face again, that led to criminal charges on the grounds of infringement of privacy rights. Ultimately, the privacy law protects people in social media the way it protects them elsewhere. Okay, let me be clear. Your voluntary posting of personal int in intimate information waives any reasonable expectation of privacy, at least as to that information you posted. But nonetheless, your privacy is still protected and fully enforceable by law in social media. When another person improperly or without your permission posts private information about you, that's the key. If they do something that you don't like, then technically you do have some legal recourse on privacy. Also, let's talk a little bit, we're talking about content, right? So digital rights management is more related to the value of the content you create in on social media and how it can be used or referred by others. The primary issue here is the duplication of your content or the reuse in some entirely new form of content. That's like me taking a clip from the San Diego chamber and then putting it on my channel without permission that's not cool. That's not the way it's supposed to work, right? But if I source them and I cite them and I use it in a certain way that respects digital rights management, then that's a total different issue. Also, some of you might hear a little bit about the DMCA rights or that stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1995. It's an extension of DRM that banned the development and distribution of technology to design to sidestep DRM, which basically, you know, you guys are wondering, it's like when people used to copy VHS tapes, I mean, some people like, you know, I'm not gonna admit to doing these things, but yes, I'm aware that this can be done, but or DVDs or CDs, 
yeah, there's laws that say you can't do that stuff. And I get it. You guys can say, Doug, this is heavy stuff, just way over. But let me at least give you this personal pro tip for your protecting your own personal privacy and that of your business. Please note, social media brand personally and professionally are correlated. You should consider protecting yourself by adding an important disclaimer on your personal and business profile that all views are my own or all views expressed are that of the ownership of your business. You see, it won't absolve you from naughty behavior, like if you're texting or posting in like the middle of the night, but it does set expectations for your audience regarding the type of content, the tone of your personal and professional life, and that you are quite aware of your own privacy rights. So I definitely strongly recommend everybody doing that. It's so much heaviness, like maybe, maybe it's time for another interactive poll. And let's get it even a little more abstract this time. So look, you know, I'm a marketer, I'm not an attorney. You gotta know your weaknesses, okay? So, you know, marketing is what I do, but I do like philosophy. So let's go for an ethical dilemma and in interactive polling, okay? This will be fun. The situation is, the reliance on digital communication in the business world surely has created ethical dilemmas involving information access and privacy, some of which I just talked about. Small business owners could find themselves in a situation of needing to comment on information on a user account of your best customer, especially if your best customer is misquoting you or your establishment. You know you're not supposed to comment on your, your customers, right? But this is your best customer and they just didn't quite get it right. But when you looked at their personal profile, you as the owner being misquoted and it's trending. This is real world situation. So question is, should you risk correcting your best customer on what really happened? Or will you do nothing despite it trending? They have the right to create content, but you have the right to defend your reputation. So now this is interactive polling question number three. What are you gonna do? Okay, are you gonna correct your best customer on the misquote or are you gonna ignore the misquote or see everyone is right in an ethical dilemma? Let's see what the polling shows. Okay, there's, yeah, there's some people willing to step in there. You're gonna push back, right? Then there's some people that are saying it's an ethical dilemma. Well, look, I kind of cheated here and gave you the answer, okay? I hope everyone in the end will say, well, first of all, it's an ethical dilemma. So whatever choice you make, you're not wrong, okay? Everyone's right. This is a difficult dilemma that you'll face on social media. As is the case with all ethical dilemmas, if you choose to keep yourself out of trouble and ignore it, well, the fact is that you know you were misquoted, right? And I agree with some of the comments now in the quotes that it depends on your industry and it depends also on how severe the misquote is. I, I love that. I love that, Matt. I love that, Amy. So, you know, think about it. Will your business suffer in some ways if customers are misled as a result of your best customer's quote? Yes, that would be called damages. But this situation is more common than you think, honestly. And the truth is that in an ethical dilemma, you're going to need to do what's right. So in some ways, you need to, as small business owners, think about what your social media policy would be, okay? You need to use good rationale and reasonable judgment, but the line you need to kind of be a little more certain as to what you're gonna tolerate and what you're not, okay? And, you know, again, at the end of the day, you're gonna face this on social media. Okay, now let's start to get a little more tactical. Let's start talking more real world, okay? What's the adequate content dose? This goes back to this chart I mentioned earlier. Like how often do you need to post and what do you need to post and where, okay? So with all the serious stuff out of the way, the first step on your path to making content king is to develop some type of social media strategy. Your social media strategy is your prescription to success. It should include these elements. First of all, select your target audience select your channel or platform of choice. You need to develop a content plan and you need to deploy and monitor, okay? And I'm gonna to go to each one of these in more depth. First things first, your audience, okay? Not your channel, your audience. 
Select the target audience is really to your discretion. You could survey your employees. If you're if you're if you have a CRM system enabled, you could run a report on who's actively buying your products. You could talk to your customers qualitatively. Most importantly, you need to segment segment them into groups based off of demographics, location, purchaseability, first time user, loyal user, discretionary time, and a big category that you can track on social media is interests, okay? Interest. Uh, next is your channel, selecting your channel. You should choose the one or two social media channels as we were talking earlier, that most makes the most sense given the target audience you selected. If you're a working professional, you probably want the complex of Facebook and LinkedIn. If you're a college student, you probably want Facebook and Instagram because Instagram favors a certain age demographic, okay? So channels is actually the question of this. Content, this is where most of the work comes. This step is a highly resource intensive area. Do you have lots of content? Do you have photos, videos? Uh oh, here we go. Just making sure everyone can hear me. I think they can hear me, okay. Do you need to create photos and videos? Are you a good writer? Is someone on your staff able to create two to three posts a week? Do you have a place to put all these posts and content for collaboration? Are you prepared to outsource it if you need it? And we were talking about this actually before the session. So making your contents big, but what will take you from being good to great with social media, it's in execution and monitoring. This is the last step. Create posts for your target audience, scheduled to deploy on a selected channel at a frequency that makes sense for your audience and for your resource level. Reach internal agreements amongst all of you on what your key performance indicator is or your KPI. In marketing consulting, I get it. I get the question all the time. Is my content good? Okay. If you would follow the process, I'm saying it should be clear. Is your audience clearly defined? Did you select the right channel? Are you making the right content at the right frequency? And lastly, what is your KPI? Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about rhythm, okay? I get this a lot too content calendars, okay? So Doug, I just don't have time to maintain even my own social media and never mind that of my social media of my business. Please note that addressing the frequency of social media content, it's not the Penrose impossible staircase that you would think for those Inception fans out there, but rather it's just an issue of organization and assessing what your resources could be. The solution here is to develop a social media content calendar. As you can see here, my teams, we use Smartsheet for doing this. We can categorize and set dates. We put whatever posts, whatever hashtags, we schedule it, and then we get it to deployment, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Just like your meetings for your calendar on a day-to-day -day basis on Google or Outlook. You need the same for social media. You need to plan it out. Post for a holiday, post for Taco Tuesday, post for Pizza Friday, post for that big game, Post for your own words, word of mouth events. Post for you heading to the airport for that next big meeting. This is an intimate discussion, actually. It's not always about making pretty content. It's rather more about creating this love letter online that the best you can do for your community is to keep them in the loop, consistently informed, and that you're thinking of them. Give them an opportunity to cheer you on as you achieve milestones, and they'll make those referrals they'll actually tell people about your product. This shows you're willing to engage with your audience and hence they will engage with you. Okay, next. So you've made your content, you got your strategy, you've got everything figured out, right? Wrong, deployment. Now, this is a tricky one because you don't wanna like, you're a business owner, you don't wanna deploy on your phone. You don't want to deploy on every channel. That's like, you know, four different posts every day. There's tools that can cut through the tape. 
So here are my top five tools to consider when deploying social media content. This part should be exciting actually, because see posting and seeing the effectiveness is one of the funnest parts of marketing. I mean, for my career, I've seen things go viral and I've seen things that going viral can be good or bad. You can become a meme really quickly in social media. So let's talk about it. Number one, hood suite. Um, this is the tried and true. It's been around a long time in my career. It has a lot of useful solutions for deploying content. Also, it gives you actually an indication of activity on a lot of the posts that you create. Um, it's a way that you can deploy content on all channels. So it means you make one post and send it, and then it will go to all the different channels that you um, have scheduled to. Much easier, uh, yeah, it comes at a price, but it's actually um, very useful. Next comes Loomly. This is an up and comer. And a lot of my social brilliant people, my shout out to Hunter Bragg there, um, swear by it. Uh, in terms of price per value, it allows a lot more accounts and it allows a lot of activity and it has a lot of great features for deploying social media content. Next comes Sprout. And Sprout, I use these guys for a particular client that I had an agreement with. I did notice a few artifacts and a few defects when certain preconditions were met, but I have to give them a lot of raving reviews for customer service. It felt like any issue I could email them and they would resolve it. And you can actually talk to a human person. Imagine that in the digital age. So um, I really like these guys. Four, and actually four and five are kind of different and unique guys. These are surveillance tools. So Meltwater is an amazing platform for reports on activity, keywords, trends, like what are people talking about? What hashtags are they using? Um, it's also useful uh, on all social media platforms, excluding Pinterest and TikTok, I'm so sad. But it's really good and at the same time, really expensive. So <laughs> you might have to consider that as uh, there's budget restrictions in being in small business. Uh, an alternative would be Trendkite, which is a surveillance tool as well. And it's a little cheaper than Meltwater, but it has some great tools for aggregating performance on social media year over year, which I think is important. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about organic versus paid content. Okay, so I get it. Some of you might just say, well, Doug, let me just buy my way out of it, right? Like I can just boost with ads my content and everybody will see it. Well, the truth is in social media, not all piggies are created equal to quote, quote George Orwell, Orwell in Animal Farm. Not all social posts are the same. There's a balance based between post frequency, audience, and budget, okay? So organic social media posts daily versus paid social media posts, which means a post that you're going to boost for money, um, it's actually not practical financially to just, just push any post, okay? You wanna do some trial and error here. Make sure before making any investment in social media advertisement, that you play around a little bit with some baseline understanding of what your top post content is over time, over certain dates, over certain topics. And then most importantly, did that top post achieve the desired KPI or your key performance indicator? And that can be likes, shares, views. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. If all those criteria are met, go for it, boost it. Put your money where your mouth is. But if you don't know and you haven't tried talking to that audience, I would, I would definitely advocate to practice some restraint. Next, let's talk a little bit about some more provocative forms of social advertisement, geofencing. Geofencing is an advanced concept. If you weren't in the last session, basically this is how Alexa knows you went to the movies or how Alexa knows that you went to the shoe store. You see, it's a paid form of content and it's also a form of social media advertisement. 
if you did your detective work and you know the relative zip code or travel route of where a client will be, there's a virtual perimeter, thanks to Google, of the latitude and longitudinal plot of that area. And you can deliver an advertisement to them, a packet of data that will have a call to action to go see your site. It'll be a banner. It could show up in you know, whatever the news syndicated uh, platform choices like CNN as, as a post there. And, and it could show up as a clickable icon. Say, Doug, but isn't that invasive? Totally. Is that legal? Absolutely. And But do they want this advertisement to be in their face all the time? Well, I would argue, how good is your service or product? How bad do they need it? So this is one where you really need to do some investigating on who your clients are, how they spend their time, what routes do they walk around at? And then you can really capitalize on sending a specific information packet to them using two platforms you can see here that we use in my, my group. We use Ground Truth and Taboola. And you know, again, this may be overly complicated, but if you wanna do it, like give it a try or get some help and outsource it. Oop, didn't wanna do that. Okay, KPIs, okay? This is what are your metrics of success, okay? And I wanna make sure we stay on time here for us to have questions on a lot of these topics. But um, I just wanna be clear on, here are my opinions on what success looks like in social media. And that can mean different things for all of you, okay? Okay, so subscribers or followers, um, let's say this is a big deal, okay? Subs and followers are a big deal. These are the consumers of your content. They are definitely potentially marketing qualified leads. They are definitely influencers and they are hard to get and you need to maintain them. They are hungry or content starved at times. Let's be clear. Gaining subscribers, gaining followers is a must win for any small business owner. Pay close attention, follow them, like their content. They could be your next customer. Even do something of like going to your company's page and looking at who's following you and learn a little bit about them because that may help you get some new customers. Now let's talk about views. And this is big if you're into video content. Now, let me be clear. A view means, it doesn't mean they finished the video, it means they started the video. So don't correlate views to call to action, right? Views is kind of like awareness. They're like, yeah, they probably saw that you had a video and yeah, they probably wanna interact with you. Views in the form of content result in, they're a necessary evil, but they don't win the war. They're not gonna convert to a sales qualified lead. Next, let's talk about likes. <laughs> I think likes are overrated for me. Just because someone likes something doesn't mean they're willing to buy it. Sorry, it's the truth. Shares. Oh, this one's a little bit better. If they share your content, it means they're engaged. But they could be sharing the content, whether that's for a positive reason or a negative reason. Memes are shared. So I don't know that that's necessarily a great one either. Engagement for me, is number one. Engagement is the aggregate of likes, shares, and other forms of social activity. And it includes the gold standard, clicks, which clicks means clicks to your website, which is what you want, okay? There are other indicators out there, like tonality, editorial mentions, bounce rate, session duration, but I'm not gonna bore you with them. For me, the gold standard is engagement, and building followers and subscribers. I hope that's clear. Time for our last four for four interactive polling question. All right, here we go. Okay. Small business owners, in my opinion, should be using social media as a competitive advantage. Notice I say should, but it's abstract resource intensive, and it's constantly changing. As we talked today, it's ethically problematic from a privacy standpoint, but think about it. Your best customer needs you. 
they want to cheer you on. And your unknown customers out there, they want to learn about you too. So what I'd like to do is have everybody answer the last polling question, yes, no. And this is really a question for that superhero, man or woman in the mirror. You got to look at yourself now and say, are you actively currently using social media as a competitive advantage? I'm not saying that you should. The question is, are you right now feeling like social media is your competitive advantage? Very good. We're split here. There's a big community that feels totally. Oh, look, we're split right down the middle now. This poll is getting fascinating. And then there's another that feel it's not a competitive advantage. And again, this depends upon your industry. It depends upon how you want to play, where you want, you know, what you want to do. And this is a lot of the information we were talking about earlier. Okay. Now, I want to wrap things up so we can move into questions here. Let's try to put this all together. Social media should be a competitive advantage. Social media is difficult to define, right? We all don't agree what it is, but it delivers value in providing a useful exchange of content for time that is mutually beneficial for small business owners and customers. To actively participate in social media Small business owners must clearly define their target audience, select a channel, take advantage of strength, their strengths, and build compliantly great content. And lastly, to go from good to great, you need to monitor that content for the result you want and having a key performance indicator in mind, okay? Recall, going back to the beginning of this webinar, your business is your story. Tell your story well on social media or somebody else might tell it for you. And that can be good or bad. As a small business leader, capitalize on social media for personal brand amplification and awareness generation for your business. I hope this session helps you in your business endeavors 2020 was a challenging year for all of us. I look forward to seeing you having much success on social media. Um, I hope you found this webinar informative. I hope you feel free to pass positive feedback, even constructive criticism to the chamber. You see, we wanna keep making great content and keep topics like this coming out to help small business owners. If you want to chat or have immediate business needs, feel free to reach out on my social media or you can drop me an email. Oh, there we go. Also, if you really like our content, you can thank my art team. Uh, you know, they're outstanding. Um, they can do almost anything. Um, and let's jump into some questions and feel free to add them to the chat or you know, we can unmute. I, um, and with that, if you have to go, I know you're busy, you can have a great day. Okay, here we go. First question, I'm gonna start from the bottom, uh, is from Lisa here. Doug, other than creating compelling content, any recommendations for engaging with your audience? Respond to every comment, comment on our desired audience's posts, tag people in posts, I love this question. Okay, typically something that as a best practice that we do as a group is that we'll take a look at a 30 day trend of social media. We'll go backwards in time 30 days and start to look at a couple things. What was the top post, okay? Who shared what posts? Who's saying certain things that are trending? And then we'll immediately go and follow them and like them and interact with them. And a 30 day rhythm is a little, now some could say, yeah, but Doug, that's not interactive enough. Well, here's the comment. You're a small business owner. Like it's different if I, like I'm an old, like a uh, big corporate guy. Back then when you have infinite resources, yeah, you can interact with people on a daily basis. But when you're a small business owner, you need to reserve time, set a schedule 
to go back and look at who did what and then interact with them. I think another thing I strongly can comment here, Lisa, on recommendations is we haven't talked about blogging, right? Blogging is something, it's long form written that actually benefits your site with SEO, if you put it that way. But inviting somebody that's interacting with your content to blog with you or to write a blog article with you actually is pretty amazing because it means that their social channel and their followers will read said blog and then become your follower. So I definitely feel that blogging or interacting, liking, following on a rhythmic basis is really the foundation of engaging with an audience in a more sustainable long-term way. Okay, great question there. Let's see, there's some other things. Um, okay, Amy asked the question, are there specific times it is better to post on different channels than to promote more engagement? Wow, Amy, amazing question. Okay, so actually let's talk a little bit about this. If you understand your audience, there's certain times of day that people are more susceptible to suggestions. This is like in psychology or consumer behavior, like a good, a good time. So you say, Doug, what's an example? A good time that people are susceptible is on that brutal commute to work or home. Why do you think the podcasts are so popular? Why do you think Audible is so popular? That is an interesting time to get people. So you need to think a little bit when you're rolling out your social posts, what is the state of mind you want your customer to be in? Do you want them to be on the commute to work? Do you want them to be winding down at dinner? Do you want the twilight hours of the night when like me and my art team are staying up in the middle of the night and you want us to do something? You really need to get into the psychology of the audience that you're trying to send a message to. Think of it this way. If you're trying to do an advertisement to a sports audience, then you want to post around sports prime time uh, time zones, like actually when the big game, prior to the big game. You better do it during those quarters and halftime. Don't do it when someone's about to run a touchdown. These are the sort of nuanced details for organ organic timing of content. Now, on a daily basis, something you need to look out for. If your clients are professionals, like in an office like this, well, don't post on a Saturday because they're not thinking about work. They're wanting to have fun. So you really need to think about your audience and contextually like when you should do activity. Now, the second part of your question is where it gets really provocative is about, is there a best time to promote content such as paid content? Absolutely. I don't know that I would say promoting content is a, is a time in a 24 hour type basis. It's more like promoting content around dates on a calendar. It's like, if Christmas is coming, then you probably want to promote in a paid way around like Black Friday, Cyber Monday. You want to do it around Christmas, right? If you want to promote around a holiday, like if you're a nonprofit out there, you want to promote content around Giving Tuesday. So I feel when you really are about to spend your money, I would position paid content around my opinion, word of mouth events. Like if you're going to have a launch or if you're going to have like a road show, this is kind of a time that you want to kind of do paid content. Okay, now we've got another one, right? You guys are warmed up. I think those interactive questions really stirred you up. Okay, this question's from Brittany. Thanks for the info, Doug. I'm curious if you have seen a widespread social media fatigue, especially in the last half of the year with the pandemic. If so, how do you navigate the screen fatigue folks may be experiencing? Okay, this is a really good question. This is like pandemic, pre-pandemic, or post-pandemic, pre and post. Here's my opinion. Okay, first of all, I think we all are facing social media fatigue, period, right? Like, I'm just saying, irregardless of the pandemic, like, do you really have time to manage that social profile? Or is that social profile really managing you? And I think most of us are kind of more on the latter. But overall, let's say this, quantitatively speaking, and I would encourage you, the slides will be downloadable, but you can go back and look. 
screen time is on a record high, okay? The amount of time people are doing messenger and chat is higher now. But I think my comment on this, how they're using social media is shifting because of fatigue. Here's a good example. More people are using social media to stay in touch with family than ever before. People are using Zoom for like weekly family reunion stuff. I mean, even I'm doing that. You're connecting with people you care about virtually when before like your grandmother and like your, your aunt or your dad or your brother or sister, they never used to go on social media. They never used to be on Zoom, but now they have to because of the pandemic. So I think post pandemic world, there's truth in a couple of things you're posting here, Brittany. One, yes, I agree. And the data would say there is fatigue with social media, net. But specifically speaking, post-pandemic, I think people are a little tired of screen time, also because they're putting a lot more into their job because of this work from home, right? I bet you all of you are having a hard time turning it off, right? No boundaries. You're always online. So therefore, you want release from it. And as a result, I think people are embracing lifestyle use in social media. People want to turn their brain off. Next, this is a great question, Brittany. I, I would love to pontificate on that one a little bit longer, but I got to move on. So the next question is specific times. Uh -oh, this is about specificity. If you do use one of the social media managed platforms, you can also run reports across your social channels. Absolutely. When you are getting, uh oh, when you're getting most engagement, whether whether it's day or time, for organic, I think this is more of a suggestion. For screen fatigue suggestion, this should be incorporated into your content calendar. I agree with both of these points. There's a strong social media user there. If you incorporate quick hit, uplifting type posts, funny, et cetera, it can help. And I agree 100%, 100%. Actually, that's a great suggestion there. So let's just say that overall, I think the way you should feel, your social media needs to be, as a small business owner, more less organic, more systemic more of a process and you definitely should use reports as the comment here is saying. Okay, with that, we're exactly at the top of the hour and I would not wanna be the man to stand between San Diego chamber members and lunch. So I appreciate everybody joining. I hope there was something in here for everybody. And I really, really encourage all of you, get out on those social channels, just get to it. There's nothing to it but to do it. I love you guys. I hope to hear from all of you. Take care. Bye-bye. Great job, Doug. Doug, you still there? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, I love it. You guys are the road warriors. You made it all the way to the end. You, the, the, my bounce rate wasn't too bad. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well done, Doug. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I was eager to see the polls, the, res the poll results. Oh, really? Let's see if I can uh, share results. I can do them. Yeah, Let's there's see. one. There's one, but I want to try and get all of them here. Give me a second. So this was the result of the social media. Um, is it a competitive advantage, yes or no. And what you could see is there's a split here. So yeah. this is my interpretation of that. It doesn't mean that people aren't using social media. Actually, I think almost all of the, all of you are using social media if you're on a Zoom like in this forum and attending this session. But I actually more interpret that as, I don't know if, you know, I, I, I used to run this in corporate. Finance and trying to justify spend for social media is always a challenge. It's kind of like, for the amount of time I put in, is it really advancing the ball for my business? And this is why I feel that I really emphasized in this session, you need to have a strategy and plan as to what you're rolling out, to whom, and then what is the key performance indicator that you can judge or monitor? And then lastly, can you, can you make real world business changes to capitalize on it right like and that's 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 kind of the name of the game there so i'm not totally surprised 
at that one. So let me see if I can, I think I can get other results here. Hang on, let's see here. The next one is, let's go, yep, I can. So first poll question, what is social media, right? Yeah. It's very good. It was pretty unanimous though. I'd say most people felt it's all the above. It's putting together networks, users, technology, and content. But if you note that some definitely will have certain opinions that no, it's the networks or the users. And you know what? Look, I've seen this one debated for a long time. This this has just kind of been this way for a long time. And you know, this is my dark matter analogy, right? Like it's there, but you can't touch it. But you know it's real. The scientists will say it's real. And that's really frustrating, right? So that one's a good one. So let's try another one here. So poll question number two, which is uh, you know, I was making sure everyone's having fun there. Um, if Doug were to start a food truck and his best mac and cheese were available to all of you, right? Um, is it legal? And that's notice that's the question. Is it legal to regram on Instagram uh, a positive route from a best customer? And what you can see here is extremely split result here, right? Like, like just, there's some that are like, oh, like Doug, what are you talking about? Of course, I'm going to regram. Everybody regrams. What are you talking about? Um, truth is those that are no practice restraint and know that you never know in the social media stratosphere which is the one that's going to take issue with you taking over their content and doing something. You never know. The majority of them will, will not have a problem, but a lot of them will say, hmm. And then the last group, if you know, many are like, ooh, that's a trick question, Doug. I know it. You're a trickster, Doug. There's something here. So I, you know, and, and look, that's a good thing. So look, I don't think anybody's wrong on this one. And this is the third one. I like this one too. This is the ethical dilemma. <laughs> Even when I say that it's an ethical dilemma, like, look, anything can be right. Actually, if you note, I was actually noticing while I was going through here on this one. Um, so you're misquoted, right? They got it wrong. Do you go after them? You could see that. There's some itchy, tricky fing trigger fingers out there. There's a lot of people that would say, oh, social media. I'm going to correct the, the misquote. Now, I want to be clear. I still think the majority of this group would probably correct the misquote in a very respectful way. And I saw a comment on there. Well, if you're really their friend and you're real, this is really your best customer, you're going to really want to kind of tell them like, hey, it didn't go down like this. So I think that represented, it was clear in the numbers. Yeah. And then you could see some would just ignore it. I'm actually, will say this, empirically speaking as business leaders, I'm surprised more of them wouldn't just ignore it. <laughs> like, I mean, I get it's trending, but I'd be like, ah, oh, not worth the fight. Not worth the fight. I don't know. I, I would say, ah, oh, people say things, you know, like, ah, oh, let it go. I mean, as long as it's not, you know, I think maybe the thing that really made people react is that it's trending. I think yeah. that's what caused that one. And then obviously, you know, there's some that know, well, it's an ethical dilemma. There's no right or wrong, you know, like I might be a little bit of A, I might be a little B. So I think these polls were, you know, an interesting way. And then I will say, this is important. Poll question number three caused the most reactions actually. Ah. So poll, so if you really look at the chat here, yeah, yeah, I saw that there was a lot of chatter about this one. And I think this is kind of like a real world situation. It happens all the time. Engagement. People were engaged in the question. Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't mind that. sticking around if some of you still have, have questions or considerations. It's, it's okay. I'm going to take off, but I'll see you next year. Yeah. Hey. Have a great holiday. Merry thank Christmas. You. Happy New Year to you, Bonnie. Thank you, you so care. much for including us. Bye bye. Bye bye. Any other questions? Thoughts? Doug, I've got a question for you. My name is Matt. Nice to meet you. Thanks for a great session. Yeah. I wanted to hold off on it because I realized at first it might seem like my industry is, is different than others and I didn't want to take up too much time, but I pastor a church right here in North Park in the center city of San Diego. Wow. Yeah. And the, the um, you know, so our product is meaning, yeah. connection, opportunity to serve our neighbors, faith, yeah. hope, love, and our, you know, the way we do that is by reuniting with God, reconnecting with each other, and then being redirected outward to serve all our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Our customers are generally either the poor who we're serving and helping and really not just serving in the moment, but giving them a hand up and, and new resources, but also really thoughtful, skeptical, college-educated folks who would say, hey, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, you know, 
and yeah. our feedback is once people come and they get involved, whether in person or online, the, the general feedback is, this is amazing. I can't believe more people don't know about this. You know, I feel like some mm -hmm. people say, I, I feel like I found the, the, a great restaurant and just nobody knows about it on Yelp yet. One person likened us to like hanging out with Obama back when he was a community organizer in Chicago before he became president. Grassroots, so, like, right? Yeah. So once people find us, they love it, but people aren't finding us. I'm, I'm a church planting solo pastor, more on my plate than I can eat in a day. And I've tried hiring a couple different small firms to help us tell the story, but I find that they just don't get us. And so they become sure. amplifying a message that's not ours. You sure. know, we're not trying to become a mega church. We're trying to have mega impact. We don't want this kind of like kitschy Hallmark card Christian type message. It's like very specific toward thoughtful post-Christian folks. Mm -hmm. So just hearing all that, I think other people who might still be listening in might be able to identify with the idea of just not having the time to tell your story, but yeah. yet not, not yeah. trusting other people to tell your story for yeah. you because you're unique. <laughs> it's, it's a common, it's a common problem actually. What do you think? What do you, what do you hear? Well, what recommendations? So, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about, um, my opinion here is um, something that I've learned over my career is that you're right. I acknowledge you're right. Nobody can tell your story like you, but you. But you have to look, one of the nuances and the calls to action for you as a leader is to make sure that your story, your legacy, what you do lives on beyond you, which means you're going at some point to have to find a way to get what I would say is the support team, whether that's your own staff, whether that's externals, whether that's those talented in the trade, to develop some tools that would be between, the, between you both that can retain the magic and the, the the, the passion that I even heard from you describing this now. Now, some things that my organization does when, and I'm not saying we're right. Like, I think that, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I think something you could think about a little bit is there are tools that you could look into what's called like message maps or value proposition or, um, you know, I, I even think in some cases, like economic rationales, like the, like <laughs> there's a, there's an infinite thing. There's infinite amount of things that people are doing that you could say, look, the amount of time that they would lose talking with you would be returned tenfold in that they feel better. Like there's an intangible value to what you're providing that can make a person's life different. And that's emotional. That's emotive motivation, right? So my comment there is, I think an activity that you could do, you can look this up, you can Google this, right? Like value proposition, as we know it in business, is really about getting down to the raw, lowest common denominator about what makes you special. And if you could do that for yourself and put that on paper, I would say you hand that to anybody in your tr in the trade that is very skilled. It'll help them understand and get you more. And then therefore they can use advanced techniques to get out to the people. Now I will say this, I do have another comment on that. Some things you just can't outsource, okay? Culture is one of them. And the culture of your congregation, the culture of you getting together, the culture of when you do events, or I know like when, when you get passionate, they got to see that stuff. That's not, it. written form doesn't even convey it. So that's where I was going to say, you might need to think a little bit more about the video medium. You might need to really show meetings, get togethers, but I don't, you know, I think you need to be able to Find your audience specifically, because I'll be honest, in social, there's a lot of negativity too. Like, there's a lot of like, you know, you're going to have to pick your pockets as to where you think your best members of your current congregation are and find 
is there some patterns of some trends that you can capitalize on? I don't think mass scale, like, and I agree with you, like the Hallmark, like just spamming everybody. If anything, you're just going to get a lot of negativity. And I, I, I mean, that's, I've seen this, I've seen this and, yep. and not in your, uh, you know, uh, no, that's it. And we, uh, and we geofence it. I mean, again, I'm, we're not trying to be well known in Encinitas, which is 20 miles away or El Cajon, which is 15 miles away. Mm -hmm. But we want everyone within three miles of downtown San Diego to know that we're here for them, whether mm -hmm. or not they choose to take us up on the offer right now or they hold it in their pocket for later. You know, we just want, yeah. we want the exposure and the invitation out there. Yeah, I think you look, have you now do you do any active polling of your of your congregation? Have you done that? Like not you, active polling and our two channels are Instagram and Facebook. And I have someone that helps manage those. And then we we pay a, a company that helps to manage uh, SEO and Google Google ads and all that stuff. Yeah. So you're doing all the right things. But again, I'd say this, you got to set up your external contractors for success. That's it. And and to do that, like, for example, you saw, look how much we learned from four interactive questions just in an hour. Think about that, right? Like, like it, it, it's fascinating to see where everybody's mind's at. Imagine if you were to pull your own members of your own congregation or your own workers that work there. You're going to learn things about why they joined. You're going to learn about what was the, what was the thing that did it for them? What was the tipping point, right? And then now you got to start to say, write that down. What's the value in that? What, what's, what, what is it, right? And then you need to start showing it and you need to start videotaping it. And then you can, in my opinion, set up these vendors and these other people that are trying to work for you. I don't think that they're, let's put it this way. I'm not going to call it cry foul. I don't know that they're do, not doing their jobs. I think it's more they need to be set up to succeed. That's right. I need to hype the hype people. That's right. That's okay. Right. I'm, I, I see there's more people here. They might want to talk to you, but I just want to thank you. Thanks for your time. It was great. Yeah, I appreciate you, Matt. Great, great, great question. Great appreciate stuff. Appreciate you. Yep. Okay, take care. That might be it, actually. Okay.